right, we're ready to sing. Yeah. You better stay seated. If you will, would you stand, please? Johnny, we're ready to go on to that. Let us begin our time of worship this morning with a moment of remembrance. We, we remember all the soldiers and the sacrifices they made for the sake of others. Let us begin our time of worship with a moment of thanksgiving. We thank God for the great Let us begin our time of worship with a moment of silence. For a moment is the least we can do for those that gave their eternity. And we'll be singing together now, God of the Nations.
We confess that we have not loved our neighbors, let alone our enemies. Forgive us for failing to live up to your commandments. Empower us to work for your kingdom in this world and welcome us by your grace into your kingdom in the next. Amen. And you may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah, from the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. And with two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew over to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We're going to now sing my country tis of thee this morning. <laughs> It's in the sixth chapter, beginning with the first verse. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too we might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We will certainly be united with him in a, in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. I think I have read further than Johnny had. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Actually, you know, I, that's not what I wanted to read. So let me just keep, you're going to get to hear more scriptures today. Yay. I've got two different things going on here. One's yesterday and one's today. So let's do this a different way. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you're put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. Now, that's better. <laughs> Thanks be to God. So there's things that we talk about. This is Trinity Sunday. This is the Sunday when we realize that we've gone through uh, the Old Testament. We've got God figured out. And we've had a lot about Jesus. He was, you know, Advent came and Jesus was born and then he was baptized. And then we had Epiphany and then uh, we had Pentecost last week. And so now we have this time of, of, of realizing what it means to have this God three in one. It's one of the most difficult concepts in all of Christianity because it's just one God but able to do three different things and it takes all three different things to make one God. So we have God the Creator that went out into the world and made all of this out of chaos, out of nothing. We have Jesus who came and gave us this challenge to love one another, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And then we have the Spirit, which we recognize the presence of last week in Pentecost, which I believe is the instruction manual for the other two. If you were a person that watched the, the, uh, the shack, I think that there's a pretty good representation of the Holy Spirit in there. Although, because I grew up during Disney times, I couldn't help but see Twink Tinkerbell when I saw that. It just reminded me of Tinkerbell. Maybe Tinkerbell is the Holy Spirit. I don't know. <laughs> I always thought it was kind of Jimmy Cricket sitting on your shoulder saying, don't do that. But, uh, but I think the notion of the Trinity and why we celebrate it is, is exemplified in these passages. We have this passage in, in Isaiah, which is way before Jesus came, when they have this realization that when God touches you, God has the ability to forgive your sins and to send you forth. And the question is asked at the end of that passage, who shall I send? And I think God's still asking that question today. Who shall I send? And the answer for us Christians, because we have already accepted Christ, stood in front of a church somewhere and said, I believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've all done that. Then we are the ones that really are saying, here I am, send me. Amen. But the description of the world is right, right? We, he lived in a time when he was, he called it, untruthful or sinful, and he lived in a sinful world. You see anything different today? We are, by nature, sinful, and we live in a world that exemplifies sin way more than it does grace, mercy, and love. Amen. And so we're supposed to be called to be something different one of the reasons I told the silly joke about the Catholics and the Methodists is that, that we are maybe different biologically from male and female, but as children heirs, as this describes it, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Not so much in the Methodist church, but in the Baptist church, and all the guys get called brother so-and-so and the ladies get called sister so-and-so because when you're baptized, your last name goes from being whatever it is to being Christian. 
We are supposed to be brothers and sisters with our Baptist friends, our Catholic friends, our Lutheran friends, our Pentecostal friends. We're supposed to be united in the kingdom to do kingdom work. Amen. And instead, because we're people, we like being fractionalized and minimalized and moved into corners or silos where we just do it our way and they can do it their way, but let's don't do anything together. I really believe this. I've said it many times. If churches did what churches are supposed to do, we would not need governmental welfare. What do you mean? Well, it's real simple. Every church can't do as much as other churches, but every church can do something proportionally. I mean, we're doing our part. We're feeding people out of the blessing box. Could we do better? Sure. But are we doing something? Yes. And if every church did something, it would be better than trying to sit around and compete to say, can I do it better? Maybe we would realize what we realized here about 10 years ago is that we were doing, we were doing a vacation Bible school here for like seven or eight kids. Let me tell you, if I'm a kid, send me to vacation Bible school with 30 kids. It's just more fun. And so we have to realize that's not our forte here at Hope. We don't, that's not the thing we do the best. And we're okay with that. Do we miss out on it? Well, yeah, but we get to catch up when we get the pumpkins, right? And we get to have the kids come from the pumpkin patch and do all that other stuff. So we get to do that. It's different. It's not the same. But that's something that we do well here. Other churches have things they do better. And, and I never really understood why we don't, you know, if they got a pipe organ and they're having a concert, why don't we all go there and listen to it? If we want to listen to that. But it seems like people are just in these silos of doing stuff. Well, I'm only going to do it with my group. Hey, I witnessed this firsthand, but I tried very hard. When I was serving in Laporte, every Easter Sunday, they have a, uh, a non-denominational sunrise service at Silver Beach. Uh, they pick, usually the newest preacher in town gets to preach, whatever denomination. And they mix up the music, and they do all the stuff, and everybody supports it, and it's pretty full. Silver Beach Pavilion's pretty full. And when it's not raining, they, they, you see the sun come up out over the bay. It's a beautiful place to have a sunrise service. We tried it here in Pasadena. We tried so hard. We did it at the Rotary Pavilion. Sunrise, Easter morning. Oh, we used to have our own here in the courtyard, and we used to share it with Parkwood Church years ago. But we thought, you know, let's bring everybody in the city together. It's only one Christ, one empty tomb. Let's get everybody together and say, Christ the Lord is risen today with 300 or 500 people, not 100 or 20. Uh, hardly anybody showed up. Now, that tells me something about the community we live in. I believe most people would say we live in a Christian community. As far as I know, there is no synagogue and no mosque in Pasadena, Texas. And the truth is, you could probably close one out of the six churches that are there, or maybe two, and you wouldn't even notice it. And for sure, you could close five of them and all the people would fit in the sixth one if it remained open. Now that's sad. We've been called to change the world. We're a part of a revolution called Christianity. Jesus said, go into all the lands, nations, whatever version of that you want to read, and make disciples. Now for them, that was a pretty small area. It's about 12 miles either side of the Jordan River. But this is 2021. The lands are bigger. We know more stuff. We go more places. One of the saddest things I know is that when I got into ministry, we were sending people to China to be missionaries, and now China's sending missionaries back to us. Now, I'm not saying that to make people feel bad, or like one person told me last week, they had sore toes after the sermon. I, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to tell you we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have more resources than the disciples had. We have all kind of good stuff going for us. We've got Facebook, the Internet. We can talk to people now with, with a cell phone. We don't have to have a landline. There's so many things we have today, and we don't seem to be doing as good of a job as they did when they didn't have that stuff. Maybe we take people for granted. But I'm pretty sure that wherever these seraphs live today, that they're still asking the question, whom can I send? And we have already stood up somewhere and said, send me. The question is, where are we going? 
When, when we answer that call to be sent, are we saying, well, send me as long as it's air conditioned and convenient, or it doesn't happen when it's inconvenient. One of the things I learned when I became a preacher was that death calls happen when they happen. You can't plan them. They happen when they happen. And, and one of the things the bishop asked us when we're ordained is, will you go where you're sent? And we say yes. We don't all go. Every preacher doesn't respond. All people don't do it. We're all human beings. We make mistakes. We forget. And the preacher can't do it by himself. I get floored sometimes. So, you know, I go places. Preacher, would you pray? Well, you know, you, wait a minute. I'm not the only guy in the room that knows how to pray, right? I mean, you don't have to have some eloquent prayer. In fact, if you've been with me at all in any kind of public meetings, my public prayers are usually pretty short. It a lot of times it's around food. And there's a rule about that. The guy with the hot food ought to pray because he's going to pray the shortest. <laughs> It isn't the length of the number of words of the prayer. It's the fact that you do it. When we hear from people like Rodney that Linda's mom is in the hospital and we say, well, I'll pray for you. Is that something we say or do we really do it? That prayer thing is dangerous. Let me tell you what I learned about prayer. I pray for it to change the world and it changes me. Over and over and over again. That Isaiah passage, whom shall I send? That's a gutsy move to say, here I am, send me. Don't say it if you don't mean it. Because God will send you to places you never thought you'd be. To be sitting by the bedside of people you never thought you would and to, to, to care and love people that you never thought you would like. The commandments. Jesus' commandments, they're really not complicated at all, are they? Love one another. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Oh, we can get caught up in the do not steal, don't murder, don't do it. Yeah, we can. If you love one another, and if you love others as you love yourself, you're not going to do that stuff. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't come to take away the law. He came to fulfill the law. And we Christians have got to get to work because i got to tell you, the world is hurting. I've not in my almost 70 years lived in a time when the world was as fractioned as it is right now. Over sometimes very silly things. Things that are not eternal. Things that are really temporary. I think sometimes we don't realize what a big deal it is to say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I know for me, you know, I went to almost 31 years ago or 32 years ago to recovery into recovery with Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, they talk a lot about a higher power and I never knew, I always knew that was Jesus. I always knew that Jesus was with me and I had the occasion to work in a psychiatric hospital for some years. One of my jobs was to go out to talk to preachers and people so that, that uh, y'all probably aren't aware, but some years ago down at First Methodist downtown, uh, Bill Henson was the pastor and he'd been doing some counseling for a guy and the guy showed up at the church and, and it's kind of a fortress to get in there but he got in up to the offices and he said I need to speak to Dr. Henson Dr. Henson wasn't there and so a guy named Eric Anderson said well I'll go help him and the guy killed Eric that day in the office at the church and so we kind of learned a lesson you know counselors get trained to be counselors we get trained to be preachers and those are not the same thing doesn't mean we can't listen doesn't mean we don't care but there's a certain time when we need to refer people off somewhere else and when i was working for psych hospitals that was my job is to go out and talk to people about the reason that this could be useful to you preachers out in the world and you can't imagine the number of times that i heard a preacher tell me you know if they just had more jesus they'd be fine let me tell you mental illness is mental illness it's real, just like cancer and a lot of other things. And it's, it's, it's the real deal. 
And, and some of it's out of, I, you know, don't come to me for brain surgery <laughs> and don't come to me for that kind of counseling. But I know we have resources and because we're a connectional church, we have resources. We got a place called the Chris Samaritan Center down in Clear Lake that I can refer people to and they'll they'll take you in and it doesn't if you don't have insurance, they'll work with you on the costs and all that other kind of stuff. But there's a stigma around that, right? That, that, that I don't want to admit I need help. I don't I don't want to admit it. And and one of the things I learned when I came here, because I talked openly about my own recovery, was that people in the church began to talk about their issues as well. If you don't let somebody know that you've been hurting, they're afraid to tell you that they're hurting. And you know what? There's not a person in this room that hasn't been hurt sometime. There's not a person in this room that hasn't had their feelings hurt. There's not a person in this room that hasn't felt lonely or alone or left out. It happens. And the only way to overcome that is to get connected. I, I tell people this. One of the things I am qualified to tell you is that the easiest way to get through things like depression and, and anxiety and all those things is put something on your calendar and go do it. Even when you don't feel like it. My shoulder hurts. That surgery, it hurts. I, I can't raise my arm any higher than about like that. I could go home and sit there and you know what? My shoulder still hurt. At least when I come here, I get a little bit of a diversion. And y'all are funny and we talk and I get to say hi to people and I feel better. I promise you that's the case for you too. Chris Proctor told me one time a few years ago, for, he's been our worship leader on Saturday night off and on since 2009. He said, you know, there have been a lot of Saturdays. It got to be about 4 o'clock. I was thinking, man, I don't think I want to go to work tonight. There have been a lot of Sunday mornings when I wasn't a preacher. I thought, man, I don't know if I want to go to church today. I could just turn it on TV, you know. Or now you could just wait and get our church. And what, what was funny was Chris said, you know, there's never been a time that I came that I didn't feel better after I left, when I left after I'd been after being here. And I think that's always true. And so the, the reality is we've got to help people overcome their anxiety and their fear. We've got to let them know that you can come here and be imperfect. You can come here and have problems. You can come here and be a mess. You can come here and be a hot mess. It'll be okay. Because you know what? Some of us are hot messes. And this scripture ought to give us affirmation that when the Spirit reaches out to us, it doesn't have to literally use a coal from a fire pit and touches us. We can be absolved of what we were and of our worries and our troubles and give a new life. And it's never too late to start it. Years ago, we had a couple that came to church here. Names were Kay and Hank. After so Kay and Hank was about 82, I think. And after a few times of visiting, they said, well, we want to join the church. And so if you ever have that conversation with me, the first thing I'm going to ask is, okay, have you been baptized? In the Methodist church, we'll accept your baptism from wherever. As long as it's a Trinitarian baptism, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're good with it. And so Kay told me, he said, Hank hadn't been baptized. 80 some odd years old. Hard to imagine. So I met with him and talked to him about it and said, this is what baptism means and this is what it means for you to stand up and make a public profession of something that probably you believe for years anyway. And so they came forward and we baptized Hank. It probably wasn't 90 days till Alzheimer's took over and he would not have been able to make that decision. It's, we, we make a difference in people's lives in ways we'll never know. Sometimes it's scary to think about the responsibility that it is to be a Christian. You know, when you wear a cross around your neck or you have a fish on your car or you park in front of the church and other people see your car, they expect a certain kind of behavior. Actually, I think the world expects the other kind of behavior because they think we're all hypocrites. I got to laugh because Zig Ziglar said that one time. He said, you know, God told him, he said, I quit going to church because church is full of hypocrites. And Zig said, well, that's absolutely true, but at least the hypocrites in church are closer to God than you are. <laughs> we all are hypocrites. We all sin. We all make mistakes. We all even say things that we shouldn't have, and we all reach out there the wrong way. But we can overcome that through the Spirit, when we start to realize this isn't some body, this is my brother and sister in Christ. 
and I can treat them like I would a real, I, I, I'm an only child, so I have to work at that, I, but I did raise two boys. I know what that's like. I'm not gonna fight you like they fought. <laughs> Still do in some ways. That brotherhood thing, my, my wife tells me all the time that we have a, a beagle, most of you know I have a beagle, his name's Sammy. We have a little terrier dog, her name is uh, Ziva. She is like a little sister to Sammy. She, he lays down and he's going to do nothing because he's about four years old. And she goes over there and, and starts nipping at his tail or his feet or something because she wants to play. Kathy said that's exactly what it was for her and her brother growing up because he was a few years older. Uh, and Jerry, you and Ron may have experienced some of that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he did most of the picking. Though, yeah. But, <laughs> but you know, that, that that's the kind of thing. It's okay to pick on each other. It's okay to love each other that kind of loving way. That's not destructive. The question is, what about these people that don't, what about all these kids up at the school that have, they, they live in, in separated families. Dad lives one place, mom lives somewhere else. They see their mom or their dad on first, third, and fifth weekends. They don't have a grandparent that lives close by. You know, one of the things we can do is we can be their grandparents. We can welcome them. We can teach them to read when we get that chance when it opens up the school. We can, we can do those kind of fun things. These scriptures, especially the Isaiah passage, works on me a lot. Who shall I send? Here I am, send me. But friends, you can't answer that unless you understand that you will be led by the Spirit if you make that commandment. If you make that commitment to, to be led, if you make that commitment to be an answer to God's call, the Spirit will lead you. I'm pretty sure that God hadn't quit asking the question. I'm pretty sure that God's still reaching out to every single person on this planet. But there's a lot of distractions. Have you noticed? There's more distractions now on Sunday morning than when I was growing up. Remember? Some of y'all remember. The stores were closed. They had big nets over some of the stuff in the grocery store because you couldn't buy some things. I was always very confused by it. Many things about my childhood were confusing. But what I have learned in more recent years is that when I can get past those things and start to realize that God has a purpose, I believe, for every single person. When the scripture says God knew you when you were being knitted together in your mother's womb, I think it's telling the truth. Some years ago, a friend of mine was appointed to a church not too far from here. It had recently moved from downtown in that little city out to the, the loop. And the church had gotten very isolated out on the loop. It had all the wealthier people. Everybody was well-dressed. They all had nice cars. And they sort of lost focus. And he knew that I was kind of a person that liked to do ministry for people in need. And he called me and he said, what would you say to this church? And I said, well, the only thing I can think of right now is I would ask them, what do you think is happening in this community that breaks Jesus' heart? Now, I know we got other stuff going on in the community, right? We got bad streets in some cases, and we got some crime going on. What do y'all think is going on in southeast Harris County, Pasadena, Deer Park, Laporte, Sagemont, wherever we all are from? What's going on out here that breaks Jesus' heart? And if we can identify it, can we do anything about it? We learned that Pasadena Schools has a very high incidence of unexpected pregnancies in high school. We didn't know that. We learned that after Harvey, they went from having 15 or 1,600 homeless people, children to something like 15,000. We learned that there's stuff going on, and the churches did get together, and they, they decided what we're going to do is we're going to help the mentoring program, and they've done that. There was a couple of years where our church had the most people of any church doing mentoring in Pasadena School District. We had about 13 people out of the 25 that were doing it. Last year, well, pre-COVID, we had about 250 from all the churches. It's an improvement. But we also have to realize there's some things we can't fix. And on those we can pray. And we can ask for God's divine guidance on what to do and how to do it. But let's don't lose sight of the fact that there are some things we can't fix. One of the things we do, and we're doing it pretty well, is we fill that little box up out there and, and people come and get food. 
I think the pumpkin patch is that too. I think when we sit out there in that field for a month and we wave at people and we're friendly and we don't ask them, can we come in and take pictures? Yes. How much does it cost? Nothing. When we just provide a place for people to be in a neighborhood to have a safe place, I think that's part of doing what I'm talking about. Is they got to find out that we're not, but this isn't about, oh, how many people can we get to come to church that'll put money in the offering plate? Although that's essential. We need that too. But that's not our, oh, I believe when we do what God's called us to do, when we answer this call, when we say, here I am, send me, the offering plate's full. Always has been. When we do what God calls us to do, God provides. You know, God doesn't need the money. I guess y'all are aware of that. God, God doesn't have a charge card. God doesn't need money. But sometimes we need to let go of some. We need to reprioritize our life. That's one of the ways that we start to learn to answer that call. I think when when uh, Romans, and I know Romans is always a, a wonderful place to go in the Scriptures. When it says, for in hope we were saved, Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what's seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for patience. There will be a reckoning. It's going to happen. Scriptures tell us every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. That day is coming. But I don't want anybody that I know to be left out. And I don't want to make my entrance into the pearly gate and answer to Jesus. And I know I'll get to heaven because I will profess Jesus Christ. But I don't want it to have to be confronted with, yeah, but remember that time when you didn't? I think we're called to answer that call. Here I am, send me. And I trust that if we can answer it, whatever happens, Whatever happens to our lives here, we'll experience eternity with God. I have to say this because it's Memorial Day. I know a lot of people, I don't think, really understand Memorial Day, but we do celebrate our veterans. We love them all. We're thankful. But today we remember those that didn't come back. It doesn't matter whether they're in the Coast Guard or the Army or the Navy or the Marine Corps the National Guard or the militia. In fact, I would think it absolutely also includes our local law enforcement people and all those that have given everything for us. And so today we remember they answered the call. When they were said, who shall I send? They said, here I am, send me. They gave it all so that we could be here Seems to me that we owe it to them. The founders of this church, the people that, that started Pasadena, the, the founding fathers of Texas. To do like they used to teach me in Boy Scouts when we went camping. Leave it better than it was when you got here. Can you hear the call? God says, whom shall I send? I hope He sends me and you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know what? Let's do something different. Uh, no, we can't. We don't have him. We'll sing, we'll sing over I love Jesus. It'll be fun. <laughs> <coughs> As you're able, let's stand. If today be the day you die with our church, come forward as we say. This is a name, my Lord.
On Trinity Sunday, let us remember that God started it all. Jesus showed us how it works. And the Holy Spirit will guide us through. We don't pass an offering plate right now because of COVID. We'll be doing that again soon, I think. But there is a basket in the back. We gladly accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings there. Friends, go in peace and have a wonderful Memorial Day holiday.